and then you posted this article, uh, Bernie Sanders and his enemies uh, to the left. Uh, you point out the groups. Oh, is this in reference to his conflict of Black Lives Matter? Yes, and the fact that the identity politics crowd, the social justice warriors, the politically correct crowd or whatever, uh, they're they're really attacking Sanders now for being an old white guy who's had less than favorable things to say about immigration and who emphasizes working class issues as opposed to race issues or gay issues or women's issues and things like that. That's that's the root of that conflict where the 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 cultural far left ha- has enforced a lot of opposition to Sanders over these kinds of things. You know, they see him as a as an uh, an archaic old leftist where everything's about class and economics, and they don't see it that way. To them, the cultural issues are what matter. You would describe that the American establishment has become sort of a coalition between uh, economic economically they're in favor of. Economically plutocratic, but uh, culturally leftist. Yeah, well, there's a lot of issues involved in that. But I think what happened, I think we can trace a lot of this back to the um, late 60s and early 70s, and that is during the cultural upheaval that occurred during that time, I think a lot of establishment figures realized that a way to curb any genuine radicalism in the United States would be to essentially buy off the cultural left. Um, or, and, in fact, the, the Democratic Party had a strategist named, named Fred Dutton that wrote a book about that in, as far back as 1970, where he argued that if the if Democratic Party wanted to be competitive in the future, that's what they needed to go for, was to try to uh, let be less of a working-class-oriented uh, uh, you know, social democratic populist, New Deal, Democratic type of party, and instead orient themselves more towards the cultural left. And that happened in 1972 uh, when the Democratic, uh, when the new left started taking over the infrastructure of the Democratic Party. Um, and over time, uh, the, the Democratic Party establishment was essentially able to buy off the uh, cultural left by giving them what they wanted on abortion, on gay rights, on affirmative action, on immigration, on all these other social issues. Uh, in exchange, however, the Democratic Party actually started moving rightward on economic issues. In fact, that's where Bill Clinton comes into the picture because there was a think tank back in the 80s and early 90s, a neoliberal think tank, uh, the, the Democratic Leadership Council, that in many ways uh, hand picked. Bill Clinton as sort of to be their guy, their front guy for their perspective, which was to move rightward on economic and foreign policy level issues while placating the left with social issues. Uh, and that more or less describes what, what the Democratic Party has done since then. And I think with the ascendancy of the neocons in the Republican Party, the neo- neocons went into the Republican Party in the 70s and they started working their way into the Reagan administration in the 80s, and by the time of George W. Bush, they'd pretty much taken over the Republican Party. Uh, And the neocons are similar in the sense that they have extremely hawkish views on foreign policy, and they're very rightward-leaning on economic issues. At the same time, they're, I wouldn't say left, but but, but liberal on social issues. They don't really care about immigration. They don't really care about gay rights. They don't really care about abortion. They don't really care about racial identity politics or that kind of stuff. Um, You know, what role is the neocons playing in the election? I know uh, Sheldon Adelson is their big uh, financier. They have, I mean, their their popularity is, has diminished, but they still have a lot of influence because of their their wealth and uh, access to the media. What role are they playing in the election, especially the <coughs> the Republican primary? Well, among the Republicans, it's obvious that Jeb Bush is their handpicked candidate. That's the guy that they want for the next president. Um, and then they're grooming some of these others as a standby. I think you know, I think Cruz and and Rubio and and even Ben Carson and some others are are standbys. You know, I, I think it's a, for the neocons, I think it's a matter of you know, we'll 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 back whatever candidate we think can win. You know, we'll groom a whole bunch of guys as our potential candidate and and see what we get. See, we'll throw candidates out there and see what what flies. I think Bush is who they want. It's obvious Jeb Bush is who they want. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the one of the sons of the first family, so to speak. Um, 
but uh, if they if he doesn't work, I think they they have others in mind as a, as a backup candidate. You know, the, the neocons don't really care of who their who their candidate is as long as he's going to uh, back the American Empire, as long as he's going to take a hawkish view on foreign policy and support Israel and things like that. That's that's what they care what? about. Interesting about Trump is Trump is actually pandering to the neocons in foreign policy, but a lot of the neocons absolutely despise Donald Trump. Yeah, um, and I, I think that it's because he comes outside the ranks of the Republican establishment. I, I think that they know he's someone that they're not going to be able to control, um, and I think that they they consider him a uh, well. Well, they had a similar view of Ross Perot as well. They had no use for Ross Perot when he came along. They didn't try to co-opt Ross Perot or get on the on the Ross Perot bandwagon because I think they had the same view of him that he's somebody they weren't going to be able to control either. Uh, and they know that's not going to work with with Trump. Um, so you know, the, the neocons want a president whose strings they can pull, and I think they see Jeb Bush as the as their guy, and and some of these others might be a backup plan. Um, you know, Donald Trump is not really a hardcore Republican anyway. I mean, he's actually been a Democrat in the past. Uh, you know, he had Hillary come to his wedding. Uh, so he he's definitely a maverick. I mean, he's very much within the establishment. He he's you know he he is a member of the plutocratic state capitalist class, if anybody is. So he's very much an establishment figure, but he's also a maverick figure within the establishment. Uh, you know, he's kind of like the guy who's too rich that he needs to care, basically, and that's why he can say the things that he says. Uh, you know, at the Republican debates, for example, he was basically admitting that the system is based on organized bribery. Uh, you know, and he says he tells all the other candidates, "Look, I've gave, given money to all you guys at some point." Um, so uh, that's not who the neocons want as, as their as their candidate. So I was talking about this with a previous guest, Bay Area guy, and we kind of came to the conclusion that the political ideal would be to combine the the best aspects of Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, or better yet, say like uh, <coughs> Pat Buchanan and Ralph Nader. What do you yeah, What are your thoughts yeah. on that concept? Oh yeah, I mean a Buchanan Nader uh, campaign would be great. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if either side would go for that, but it. it but uh, I think Ralph might. I don't know if Pat would, but um, the. Uh, but that's not going to happen, obviously. Um, but a, a Trump, a Trump Sanders election would be interesting. Um, Trump, Trump's economic nationalism, and and Sanders' more conventional social democracy, w- would be something that's somewhat different from what we normally get. Uh, you know, normally we have. Two candidates that are represent, representatives of the neoliberal corporate establishment. You know, there's the you know the Clinton dynasty, the Bush dynasty, uh, who essentially have the same same basic set of ideas. There's not much difference between any of them. Uh, economic nationalism is is definitely uh, a shift from standard brand Republican economics to standard brand supply side ideology, and Sanders is is much more serious about uh, his social democratic outlook than any of the conventional democratic politicians are. So a Trump versus Sanders election would certainly be interesting. Uh, and yeah, both both sides have some interesting ideas. I, you know, I'm, I'm, a far, I'm far more radical than, than either one of them, obviously, but that would be an interesting contest to watch. What I, was, what I thought about is uh, like uh, fusionism, combining the best of the views into one candidate. But I think the problem with I mean, I'd personally like to see that, but the problem is that people are very rigid in politics. It's like you have to pick a team, and that team adopts this, this, all these positions, or the other team adopts all these positions. So there's, it's very difficult to engage in political fusionism because then you become politically homeless. Yeah, uh, and that's something I'm very familiar with. Um, I, I think actually what would happen, it, let's say we had an, uh, an election where Trump is the Republican candidate and Sanders was the, was the Democratic candidate, and I'm by no means predicting that that's going to happen, but let's assume that that happened. Uh, I think that that would actually have the effect of polarizing American politics even more than it currently is. Like research shows that the, the divide between the Democrats and Republicans now is the widest that it's been at any time in about a century. Uh, you know, the blue states and the 
red states and so forth are becoming more and more and more polarized from each other. And I think a Sanders versus Trump contest would actually have the impact of increasing that degree of polarization. I think the red staters would be more vocally red and the blue staters would be more vocally blue uh, because both of those guys come closer to representing the ideal of what both sides say they're for, uh, just in some ways. Um, the you know the Sanders is more of, of closer to being a conventional progressive than Hillary, and and Trump is closer to being a you know a whatever the red state ideal would be uh, a na- an economic nationalist or or just an, an old fashioned nationalist or whatever uh, than any of the Republicans are. So I think I think a contest of that type would actually be more polarizing than even conventional politics. Uh, now as far as you know a fusionism, I think that's a long way off, and I and I think that a, a toll. Uh, I think that a complete shift is going to have to happen in American politics. I think that um, um, you know conservatism, as presently understood, is going to have to die out. I think it's going to die out as the older generation dies out. And I think that the um, you know in, in the future, I think the the Clinton Obama Democrats are the future of conservatism. Like in the future, a few decades from now, maybe sooner conservatism is going to look a lot like the Clinton-Obama Democrats today, and perhaps something to the left of that would, would be, quote-unquote, liberalism. And the question is, what would come after that? And I think that that's how I tend to look at it. So, uh, Keith Preston, it has been a great show. I'd like to thank you for being on. Thanks for having me back. That's all we have for today's show. So take care, and we'll be back with you next time.